Hi, and welcome to Ask for Science. And the word dinosaur derives from the Greek and means terrible lizard. And this is the Amphicoelius fragilimus, that is believed to have been the largest dinosaur and land animal that ever existed, with around 60 meters long and a mass of around 135 tons. However, of this dinosaur, only the drawings of the notebook of the person who described it remain, since the bones have been lost, and the studies were carried out in 1870. So the veracity of the information that is known about this giant is doubtful. So currently, the best candidate to hold the record is the Argentinosaurus hunculensis, which could measure 40 meters long and weigh 60 tons. But is there a limit to the size of these animals as well as a limit for the size of the animals in general? Yes, and this size is determined by physics. More specifically, by the pressure that these animals exert on their lower extremities, like legs, or in some cases, also the upper ones. The pressure can be calculated with a simple formula, by dividing the force that comes from the weight of the animal by the area. With this formula, we can deduce that if we want to increase the size and keep the pressure constant in order to avoid breaking the legs, we must increase the size of this. In small animals, this is not a problem, but in large animals, the size of the feet and legs would end up being too big for them to move. In addition, the bones could not support so much weight when running, which is why there are no giant animals on Earth. What you're seeing now is the graphical representation of the size and weight ratio that exists between some animals. As you can see, they coincide more or less on the same line. This is because the animals have the femur and humerus ratio, which is the way in which we calculate the weight that an animal can support while being suitable for their size. Whales living in water can support the theoretical limit, the point at which an organism with these characteristics is on viable, and the dinosaurs were already touching it. This is why the blue whale is currently the largest living being that has ever existed on this planet. The famous Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, which is far from the size of large dinosaurs, it has been calculated that for it to be able to run at 72 km per hour, its leg muscles alone had to represent 86% of its entire muscle mass. This is something biologically impractical. In fact, many footprints have been found of these ferocious dinosaurs walking, but so far none running. This prevents calculating their speed and on the other hand could indicate that in fact they were not able to run, so the hypothesis that at most they reach 20 km per hour slowly gets more credibility. So by running you could have easily escaped from them. But we are here to see dinosaurs, surely you have already thought about cloning. How many times cloning has not appeared in films related to dinosaurs? This is Dolly the ship. It was the first mammal cloned from an adult cell. To create it, the nucleus of a differentiated cell was used. A specialized cell, like the cells of your skin, that are not embryonic, and it was introduced into an ovum without a nucleus. The resulting embryo developed in a surrogate mother, and after a while the famous sheep was born and lived for six years. Cloning is a technique that has evolved a lot in recent years. After Dolly, many other cloned animals were born for different purposes, like for example simple research, the recovery of extinct species, and even a company that was dedicated to cloning a domestic animal. This company was the first to clone a domestic animal that was called Copycat, a cloned domestic cat that lived in perfect condition with its owner and had four kittens. So what are we waiting for to clone dinosaurs if cloning is already possible? Well, there is a small difference between Dolly the ship and the dinosaurs. The DNA that was obtained to create Dolly came from a ship that was alive at the time of the extraction. On the other hand, the DNA of the dinosaurs is more difficult to get, mainly because they have been extinct for millions of years, so normally, in their remains, there is no DNA. The remains that we find of these amazing animals usually never contain it. But this is amber. It is fossilized tree resin that can have insects in them. Amber that is millions of years old have been found, and even some specimens that contain mosquitoes that could have bitten dinosaurs. That is to say, they could contain dinosaur blood. The problem is, again, DNA, which degrades very easily when exposed to the air or to the environment. So it is almost impossible that we will one day find dinosaur DNA that can be used for its cloning. However, we can always go to see movies or the telescope. A light year is the distance that light travels in a year. It is a huge distance, but the fact that light takes certain time to travel from one place to another has very interesting consequences on the subject of dinosaurs. In our daily life, we do not perceive light as something that has a limited speed, but when we look at space, 
or distances are enormous, this property does become quite present. In fact, when you look at the stars at night, in reality, the light from those stars that you're seeing was created a long time ago. Probably years ago, those stars emitted this light, and now this light is traveling from the stars to you so that you can see them. It could well be that some of those stars don't even exist anymore. A fascinating example is that of Betelgeuse, a supergiant type star that is found in the constellation of Orion, and it's the ninth brightest star in the sky, and it has a characteristic orange glow. And astronomers predict that Betelgeuse will eventually explode in a supernova. Opinions are divided on how long it would take for this fascinating event to occur. Betelgeuse is approximately 10 million years old, but because its great mass has evolved rapidly, some experts point out that the star is on its final phase of its life cycle and therefore will explode at some point in the next 100,000 years. Although it can be that it has already exploded, but since Betelgeuse is approximately 643 light years away, if it explodes today, we will not know for another 643 years. The event will be, in any case, spectacular. At the time of its explosion, Betelgeuse will shine at least 10,000 times more than an ordinary supernova, given its proximity to Earth. With more luminosity than the full moon lasting several months, it would be an extremely bright point in the sky that could be observed even during day. After this period, it would gradually extinguish until after months or perhaps years, it would be invisible to the naked eye. The right shoulder of Orion will disappear until after a few centuries, a splendid nebula will appear in its place. Things that could have already happened, but given the speed limitation of light, we haven't noticed yet. You're probably wondering what the Betelgeuse star has to do with dinosaurs. It may seem weird, but they have a fairly close relation, referring to being able to see dinosaurs. The light that arrives from Betelgeuse and all the other stars, as I have said before, takes some time to come to us. So it is correct to say that we're looking towards the past when we look up to other stars. And here's the interesting thing. In the same way that we can see the past, someone that is far from Earth could see our past. And this is fascinating because imagine that one day we discover a way to travel faster than light, either through wormholes or through warp drive. It doesn't matter, imagine that one day we managed to go faster than light and thus intercept the light that came out of Earth approximately 65 million years ago. That is when the dinosaurs were about to become extinct. At that time, if we could reach that point, we could focus our telescopes on Earth and see what happened at that moment. Thus seeing dinosaurs. The fact that we could see dinosaurs alive is undoubtedly something fascinating. And although it is theoretically possible, if we go into details, things get a little complicated. The Earth is very small, and 65 million light years is a very long distance. To put it into perspective, all the stars visible in the night sky are about a thousand light years away from us. And the Milky Way is about a hundred thousand light years across. Andromeda, the nearest galaxy, is about 2.5 million light years away from us. Look at this photo. The luminous strip on the right is the Milky Way. And that small bright disk is our immense neighboring galaxy. As you can see, it has to be very far for us to be able to see it that small. And it's only 2.5 million light years away. And dinosaurs are 65 million light years away. This implies that if aliens or some hypothetical wormhole travelers wanted to see living dinosaurs, they would have to go far away and build a fairly large telescope. Because actually from Earth, we can barely even see planets that are close to our solar system. And how big would this hypothetical telescope would have to be? Astronomy is complicated, and it gets even more complicated the further you look. So periodically bigger and bigger telescopes are needed to get the same resolution. So let's use the optical resolution formula to get the approximate size of the lens that should allow us to see dinosaurs with a good resolution. First, we choose a suitable wavelength, in this case of the visible spectrum, so that we can see. And that corresponds to 500 nanometers. We add the set distance of 65 million light years and the radius of the object to be observed, in this case, the Earth. And with that we obtain that the diameter of the lens that will allow us to see the Earth would be about 58 million meters, which is approximately one-third of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is a very large size, the lens would barely fit between the Sun and Mercury. But we said that we are here to see dinosaurs, 
so the object to observe is much smaller than the Earth. This makes the calculations change a little. Let's use the equation again, but let's put the size of the dinosaur in the place of the radius of the Earth. For example, 9 meters, approximately what a triceratops averages in length. The result would be that the diameter of the lens that would allow us to see dinosaurs would be of 4.4 light years. Until here everything is going well, right? What happens is that another problem arises. If a mirror of this size was created, space-time would begin to curve a lot and could even collapse into a black hole. For something with the density of the glass, which is about 2.5 grams per cubic centimeter, it would reach the point of collapse fairly quickly. In fact, a glass ball of just 14 light minutes of radius would have enough concentrated mass to collapse into a black hole. Oof, this method to observe dinosaurs alive is getting more and more complicated. Unless hypothetical aliens record them and show us the video in a few years, or unless we find a material that is light enough that it won't collapse into a black hole, or unless we find a way to counteract the effects of space-time warping, it is very difficult for us to one day be able to see dinosaurs using this method. What we will be able to see are ancient human civilizations since their light is still in our stellar neighborhood. But wait, we're here to see dinosaurs, and don't think that you're going to leave without seeing one. In fact, to see a dinosaur, all you have to do is look out the window and look for a bird. Because birds are not descendants of the dinosaurs. In fact, birds are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are a clade, that is, a branch of a phylogenetic tree that groups both living and extinct beings of related species from a common ancestor. The scheme that you're looking at right now represents a simplification of the dinosauria clade. As you can see, birds are at the end of a branch. Seeing it this way, you may not believe what I'm telling you. And it is logical, in fact, because current birds have evolved for many years since the rest of the dinosaurs became extinct, so they have differentiated themselves a lot. But they continue to be of the same clade. Let's see the famous Velociraptor, a theropod, one of the fossil species commonly accepted as dinosaurs closest to birds. As you can see, it's not that far from a chicken. They are smaller, yes, because probably this is what made them survive because it is fairly certain that only those species with smaller energy needs survive the cataclysm of the meteorite. And there's also the Archaeopterots, an extinct genus of primitive birds with characteristics intermediate between a theropod dinosaur and a modern bird, what is considered the missing link between dinosaurs and other dinosaurs. To many people, when this is explained to them, they feel a little disappointed. And it's normal, in fact, I include myself. It is something really fascinating to have dinosaurs alive today, but what people want to see are those ferocious and enormous animals that existed millions of years ago. Something that we have tried to do the whole video and not yet achieved. But precisely thanks to the fact that birds are dinosaurs, maybe one day we will achieve it. Epigenetics is the science that studies all those non-genetic factors that intervene in the development of life. The DNA of all animals contain genes that are not always manifested. When we evolve, our genes are not always suppressed, rather they are turned off. But they can be turned back on again. For example, we humans have turned off genes that, if activated, would cause to have thick and lush hair around all parts of our body. However, people have been found to have those genes activated and have hair all around their body. The interesting thing is that exactly the same thing happens with birds. It is known, for example, how to make a chicken have a strong jaw again, with powerful teeth. And this can be done with many other characteristics, using for example also reptiles, to be able to recover characteristics that through epigenetics could be turned back on. And using a computer to program them, we could do something very similar to a dinosaur. We could use for example crocodiles so that they would lay the eggs that the dinosaurs would hatch from. This is something that is currently not possible, but everything indicates that in the very near future it will be. But here, a rather important ethical debate arises. Is it fair to bring animals that have been extinct for millions of years back into existence only to lock them up in zoos? Thank you very much for watching the video and goodbye.